Crossing Church, how are you? You doing okay? Beautiful day, great day to be a believer. I want to welcome all of our campuses. Lots of great stuff going on. I want to welcome Macomb joining with us and Kirksville joining. Hannibal, number one float, 4th of July parade. Go big winners, that's awesome. Mount Sterling, highest offering ever. You did that last week, that's awesome. 929. Got a new, their new baptistry is, is, is in use, and uh, they're baptizing people there. It's awesome. Great stuff going on. Lima and Pittsfield. I mean, I'm just so thankful for Pittsfield because they still don't have a building of their own, and we're trying to work that out, but they're just tearing it up. I mean, they're just, people are accepting Christ, and there's just a great excitement there, and I'm just so excited for Pittsfield. Good stuff's going on, and good stuff is going on in the story. Uh, I'm enjoying studying it for myself, just going through it in, in chronological order, because it's an enriching process, it really is. And uh, last week, we left Israel in a pretty hopeless situation. I mean, it's about as bad as it gets, right? Israel was uh, in this position where their nation was really no more. The northern kingdom's gone. The southern kingdom is in exile. Those that survived it, most of them didn't even survive it. But we learned at the end of last week that God always has an upper story. Even in the midst of despair, when there's just nothing left but ruins and rubble in our lives, God still has an upper story. And it's that upper story that I really want to concentrate on today with all of you. You know, I told you last week that there were two prophets. There was a prophet Ezekiel who was uh, one of the exiles in Babylon. And then there was another prophet named Jeremiah who had uh, stayed in Jerusalem and he was actually protected in Jerusalem. Well, Jeremiah writes a letter to all the exiles in Babylon. And the purpose of his letter is to encourage them, but more than that, to actually give them God's word. Here's what God's expectation is while you're in exile. And it's very specific. It says that you need to buy a house, you need to get married, you need to have kids, you need to settle down, you need to be comfortable in that foreign land, you need to make friends with the Babylonians, you don't need to be Uh, inciting any riots or terrorism or anything like that when you're there, but just live at peace with everyone. And in 70 years, 70 years from now, God is going to deliver you out of that captivity, out of that slavery. He's going to bring you back to this nation and he's going to rebuild this nation. It's really a pretty exciting letter. And there's one part of it that I really want uh, to read to you. Because remember, this is happening in the midst of despair. This is happening when they've lost uh, their family members have have been ruthlessly killed and and they, they can't go back home and they're in a foreign land. Listen to these words from verse 11, Jeremiah 29. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. It's such a hopeful scripture in the midst of that letter. That's part of the letter that Jeremiah wrote the exiles. I know a lot of people use that for prosperity gospel today. That's not what it was meant for. It was meant for people that were in the midst of of despair, disillusionment, discouragement, and depression. Right in the middle of all of that, he's saying there's hope. Why? Because there is an upper story. Now that letter was sent to the exiles, but there are four specific exiles that received that letter and read that letter that I want to talk to you about today. The one that is most important for me to mention to you is one named Daniel. Because Daniel, when he read this letter and began to write As a result of that letter, it became the book of Daniel. Now, the book of Daniel is a prophetic book. Lots of prophecy in it, but there's also six stories in Daniel. And I hope that you're doing the reading, because as you're doing that, you're going to have time to really understand these stories. I can only have time to mention them to you today. And I want you to stick with me while I go through these six stories, because then we're going to apply them. These six stories come in order. The first one is a story about food. What do you mean food? Well, 
You know that Jews have special rules when it comes to food, eating kosher, right? And that was no different back then. They were to eat a certain way, the way that God had commanded them. Well, the Babylonians didn't eat that way. And as exiles, they had to, were going to be forced to eat the same thing that the Babylonians ate. Now, these four guys, Hananel, Mishael, Azariah, and Daniel, those four guys were given to the royal court. So they were in a very special place. And because of that, they had to eat certain foods. Well, Daniel said, if I eat this food, it's going to defile me. I'm going to be disobedient to my God if I do this. But the guy who's making the food says, hey, listen, if you end up being weak and sickly and everybody else is doing well, that's going to be a reflection on me. So you have to eat this food. And then Daniel said, listen, you just give me 10 days and let me eat just vegetables and drink water. And then you can give everybody else the food that you prepare. And I'll bet you that in 10 days, we'll be healthier. Me and my three friends will be healthier than all the other people that you feed. Well, the person who prepared the food said, okay, I think that'll be okay. I mean, I don't see what I can lose there. And at the end of 10 days, sure enough, Daniel, Hananel, Mishael, and Azariah were in better shape than all of uh, their Babylonian peers. And this is what happened as a result. In Daniel 1, 17 to 20, these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them in, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. Because Daniel chose to obey God and be courageous and obey the Lord rather than the people around him, God saw to it that he was actually promoted. Now he's become one of the key advisors to the king of the Babylonian empire. One of those big advisors. And that brings me to the second story. Because we go from Daniel 1 to Daniel 2. And the second story is about a dream that the king had. Now the king has this dream. And then he summons all of his advisors in. And he says, I want you to interpret the dream. So the advisors say, okay, Nebuchadnezzar, tell us the dream. He goes, no. If you're like a real, like a diviner, magician, seer, you should be able to tell me what my dream was. And they went, oh no, it doesn't work that way. You have to tell us the dream and then we'll tell you what it means. He goes, no. You're going to tell me the dream and then tell me what it means. They go, nobody can do that. Hmm, okay, well then I'll find somebody and kill all of you. They didn't know what to do. So Daniel was one of those guys, and he went to Nebuchadnezzar, and he goes, you give me a night to pray about it, and I'll come back tomorrow, and I'll tell you what your dream was, and then I'll interpret it for you. He says, good, fine. So he didn't kill all the advisors. So Daniel went back, and he prayed, God, tell me what the king's dream was, and God told him, and he came back to Nebuchadnezzar the next day, and he goes, here was your dream. You dreamed of a great image. The head of that image was made of solid gold. The shoulders and the arms of that, of that image was made of silver. The torso of the image was made of bronze. The legs were, were made of iron and the feet, the ankles and the feet were made of iron and clay mixed together. And what you saw was a rock, a rock that was hewn, but no man had touched it or, or had cut it out. And it came from a, down a mountain and it rolled down the mountain and it went over the toes of the image and the image fell and exploded. And that little rock that came from the top of the mountain ended up growing and it filled the whole earth. And Nebuchadnezzar goes, wow, you really know my dream. He goes, yeah, God knows the dream. And he told me, and this is what it means. You, Nebuchadnezzar, and your empire is that head of gold. 
And after you, another empire is going to come. And that's the silver. And after that one, another empire is going to come. And that's the bronze. And after that one, another one's going to come. And that's the iron. And then after that, another one's going to come. And that's going to be the iron mixed with the clay. And then God's going to bring someone who's going to bring all these empires down and it's going to fill the whole earth with his presence. What was the result of that? We read it in Daniel chapter 2, verses 48 and 49. It says this. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over an entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all its wise men. Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. Now, who's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Well, it's the same people as Hananel, Mishael, and Azariah. That's just their Babylonian names and not their Hebrew names. It's the same four friends. That's the second story. It leads us to the third story. You see, now Daniel's at the royal court now. And Hananel, Mishael, and Azariah, they're out in the province. Well, while they're out in the province, Nebuchadnezzar commissions a big idol, a big image, an obelisk, 90 feet high, made of gold. And he said, everyone, when we dedicate this idol that's in honor of me, in honor of Nebuchadnezzar, we're going to have all these musicians, going to have this huge band, it's going to be like a big worship band. And when, every, when all of that music begins to sound, I want everyone in that province to fall down on their face and worship the image. So they, they made ready for all that. The image, the image was, was done. The band assembled. Everybody had to be out in the plain of that province waiting for this dedication. And when the music began to play, everybody went down on their face to worship this image except for three guys. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, it would have been so easy, wouldn't it? Have been easy for them to say, oh, my, my shoe's untied. <laughs> oh, is it over? It would have been easy to say, did you see my car keys? I've been looking for my car keys. Have you seen any? I mean, it's pretty conspicuous, isn't it, when everybody's down on their face, to be just standing there. The only three guys standing and everybody else is on the ground. Well, how does that make everybody else feel? How come these guys don't have to bow down when the rest of us have to bow down? And they go back to the king and they say, hey, these three guys that you've placed in charge wouldn't bow down. They're treating you with disrespect, Nebuchadnezzar, and it made him mad. And he said, listen, guys, I told you to bow down. Now, I know how you feel about your God and all, but you're going to bow down. And if you don't, I'm going to throw you into a furnace. I'm going to burn you alive. And they went, you know, Nebuchadnezzar, you're a good guy. But I'll tell you this, we're not bowing down to your idol. Because we know God has the ability to save us. But even if he doesn't, we're not bowing down to your idol. We'd rather burn than bow down. Boy, that's courage, isn't it? Instead of compromise, that's courage. Well, it made Nebuchadnezzar mad. Boy, he was hacked off. So he told them to heat that furnace up seven times hotter. And he took soldiers and he had Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego bound. The fire was so hot, but by the time the soldiers got into the proximity of the opening of the furnace to throw them in, the heat of the furnace killed them before they were able to get away. And so here are these three. Can you imagine being Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in midair, flying in midair, being tossed into a furnace and going, this is the end of my life right now. And falling into that furnace with flames all around you, falling into those hot coals and recognizing that it's not burning you. What would that be like? What would it be like to look around and you're like laying in hot coals? Then you stand up and you go, dude, <laughs> that's pretty cool. Bible says that Nebuchadnezzar actually looked into the furnace to see them. This is in Daniel chapter 3. Let's look at that together. Daniel 3, 
verses 24 and 25. It says, Then King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement and asked his his advisors, Weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? And they replied, Certainly, O king. And he said, Look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. I wonder who that was. Hmm. And he told them to come out. And you know when God works a miracle, he works it so completely that there's no wondering whether or not he did it. It says all of the ropes had burnt off of them, but there wasn't even the smell of smoke on them, let alone any hurt or damage or burn, burning from the fire. So what was the effect or the result of that story? That result of the story was that Nebuchadnezzar issues a decree that no one is able to anymore discriminate against them or their God, and they are protected by God. From that time on, no law is allowed to be given that discriminates them, uh, against them because of their faith. That's the third story. The fourth story, the king has another dream. He has a dream of a tree. And God gives that story and the interpretation of that dream to Daniel. But he's afraid to tell Nebuchadnezzar it's not a good ending. But Nebuchadnezzar says, don't worry, I won't kill you for the interpretation. And he tells Nebuchadnezzar that his dream means this. That one of these days coming up, you're going to consider yourself greater than God and you're going to commit blasphemy against God. You're going to be too prideful and God's going to bring you down. You're going to go insane and you're going to become like an animal and you're going to live in the forest like an animal for seven years until you finally realize that you're not God and he is. And when you give glory to God, he's going to bring your sanity back to you. And he, he thanked Daniel for that story. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. And after it happened, after he lost his mind and then regained it seven years later, this is what uh, he wrote. He wrote it as part of a letter. It's in Daniel chapter 4, verse 37. He says, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven because everything he does is right, And all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Wow. I'd say that Nebuchadnezzar really learned his lesson about God. And he did it because these guys were around him. Well, that's the fourth story. Now let's go to the fifth one. Are you hanging on with me? Fifth story. The fifth story happens after Nebuchadnezzar's died. And he's been replaced a couple of times with new leaders of the Babylonian Empire and it came to a man named Belshazzar. Belshazzar's the new king and he decides to throw a big banquet. He's all excited but he doesn't have that respect for God that Nebuchadnezzar had, his ancestor. And so he decides in throwing this banquet, I'll get all the silver goblets out that we took from that temple that we burnt down years ago in Jerusalem. And we'll use those to toast each other and get drunk. Well, that didn't sit well with God at all. And while they're all having their dinner party, eating and drinking and having a good time, a disembodied hand appears and starts writing on the wall. And he writes words on the wall that no one understands. Mene, mene, tekel, eupharsian. What's that mean? Well, you know, they know who to call. Who are you going to call? Daniel. Not Ghostbusters, Daniel. (laughs) So they called Daniel. Daniel's Babylonian name was Belteshazzar. But they called him and they go, what's this mean? We don't understand what this means. And he goes, oh, this is what it means. You've been weighed in the balances and found wanting. And your kingdom is going to be turned over to the empire of the Medes and the Persians. And that very night, that very night, The Medes and the Persians snuck into Babylon, the city of Babylon, and took it over without a battle. And one empire was deposed and replaced with another empire. You know what's amazing about this? It's God's upper story. You remember Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the big image of gold? 
and silver and bronze and iron. That was the silver. This is the next empire that's starting, the empire of the Medes and the Persians. God's upper story is happening. You see, there's nothing in the world, in all the universe, that can change God's upper story. We live in the lower story. Lots of things change down there. But there's nothing that changes in God's upper story. One more story, and then we're going to apply it. And this is an incredible story, the story of Daniel in the Den of Lions. Well, there's no longer a Babylonian empire that's been replaced with the Medo-Persian empire. And the king of the Persians is a man named Darius. Darius is 62 years old when he takes over the Babylonian empire. And he almost immediately makes friends with Daniel. He trusts him. He believes in him. It's kind of important, though, that the Persians and the Medes that had come together, specifically the Medes, the Median Empire, they were known for their wisdom. They were known for their understanding of the universe, mathematics, all sorts of things. And so their advisors, their seers, they were the wisest in the world at the time. But since Daniel had such a reputation in Babylon, Darius puts him, this Jewish slave, over all of them. Well, that makes them mad. And they decide, we've got we to get this guy out of here because we're smarter than he is. We don't want that Daniel in there. So they come up with this plan. And they, when, when they go to Darius, they just kind of shower him with all these statements saying how wonderful and how great he is. And nobody should pray for the next 30 days, Darius. Nobody should pray to anybody but you because you're the great king. So for 30 days, we can't pray to any other god but you. And he went, wow, that's a pretty good idea. Well, what would, what would we do if a person breaks the rule? Throw him in a den of lions. Oh, it's okay. All right. Good idea. Let's do that. They just appealed to his pride. And he wasn't thinking about his good friend Daniel and the fact that he prayed three times a day every day toward Jerusalem. And the thing about the Persian Empire was this. Once the king made a law, he could not rescind that law. And you see, those wise men knew that. And so he made the law. But Daniel, he was never going to compromise. He was a man of courage, not a man of compromise. And so just like he always did, he prayed. Well, those, those wise men, those other wise men, you know, they knew he was going to do that. They caught him in the act. It wasn't like he was hiding they brought him before the king and they go, he's violated your law. And then Darius realizes he's been tricked. Makes him angry, but he has to keep the law. So he throws Daniel into a den of lions. Can't sleep all night. Just the thought of his good friend being devoured by these lions was just killing him. So he, he tossed and he turned and he lay awake all night. And the, as soon as day broke, he runs back to the lion's den. He cries out. Daniel, are you alive? Are you in there? And Daniel goes, it's fine. Like I told you, God has protected me. So Darius makes a new law. The new law is everybody who's not Daniel gets thrown into the lion's den. That's a wise man. And it says that they didn't even touch the ground before they were torn to pieces. That's a pretty powerful story. Ultimately, what it tells us is that the enemy is defeated and God is glorified. Six stories that happen in Daniel's life, six stories that happen in the midst of exile. Not all the stories, there's a lot more, but those are the six that we read in this particular book. In Daniel's book with Daniel and his three friends, Hananel, Mishael, and Azariah. Well, what do they mean to us? We've listened to the stories, now let's apply them to our lives. These stories teach us about the power over, of courage over compromise. The power of courage over compromise. And I think that there's a lot of times in our lives where it's a lot easier for us to compromise when it comes to God than to have courage. I want you to see two things. Number one, some of the greatest achievements in the Bible come in the context of defeat and loss. We don't have to be on top of the world for us to do incredible, powerful things or God do incredible, powerful things through us. We don't have to have everything our way. As a matter of fact, when things are going against us and we still lean into God, that's when our witness becomes the most powerful. I want you to look at your life right now. 
There's probably stuff that a lot of you are dealing with. It might be sickness stuff. It might be family stuff. It might be relationship stuff. It might be money stuff. I don't know. You could be dealing with all sorts of things right now. And you think, I can't concentrate on God. I can't concentrate on my relationship with him right now because I'm dealing with all this stuff. Listen, when you're in the middle of the difficulties in your life is when God gets glorified the most. God doesn't have to have the nation on top of the world in order to get credit. As a matter of fact, when they're on the bottom, he gets even more credit. God's winning victories left and right. And God's people are winning victories left and right in the book of Daniel. You see, God has an upper story. He has a plan for your life. I want you to be encouraged. You might feel like things aren't going right. Don't get discouraged. God can do something amazing with your life right now. Even though you think it's falling apart. If we'll stop being the centers of our own universe and put God where he belongs in the center of our lives, he's going to do great and mighty things. I guarantee you will. Second thing, true leadership is not measured by money or power or real estate or education. True leadership is measured by influence. We've just read about all these kings, 38 kings. And they were all leaders and they were all in charge of a nation. And how many of them actually did anything good? And now we're reading about some slaves named Daniel and Hananel and Mishael and Azariah. (laughs) And what is God doing? Are they leaders? Do they have influence? Leadership is measured by influence. What kind of influence do they have? Well, they're changing the entire course of a nation. God's using them to change a world empire, the leader of the whole world. Something that they could have never done as long as Israel was a nation. Now that Israel's been wiped off the face of the earth, it's been wiped off the map, and they've been consumed by the Babylonian empire, now they're changing the world. Sometimes we feel like, unless we have all of that other stuff, all that power-broking stuff, then we can't have influence. That's not true. God can have influence, and he has even greater influence when you think that you don't have any power at all. That's why the Apostle Paul said, "My God's strength is made perfect in his weakness. Because when he's weak, then he's actually strong. Let me ask you a question. Who do you have influence on right now? Who do you have influence on right now? Probably the people you're sitting with. Probably the kids that you left in the back. I bet you have some influence on them, right? You have friends, you have family. You are an influencer. Leadership is influence. I learned both of those lessons out of this, but I want to go a little deeper, okay? A couple of trivial things and then something that I want to leave you with. I've told you all through this series that every story in the Bible is ultimately a story about who? It's always about Jesus. You know, during the time that the Jews were in exile, they began to speak a new language. It was the language of exile. The name of the language was Aramaic. You know what's interesting about that language? It was the language that after the exile was over, after 70 years, the exiles in Israel brought that back to Israel and it's the language that they spoke. Do you know that the Sermon on the Mount and the Lord's Prayer and everything else that Jesus said to his disciples, he said it in that language. They're all said in the language of exile, the language of Aramaic. Second thing was Daniel's, that's just trivial. Second thing that's trivial, but it's pretty powerful. Second thing is Daniel's title. Daniel had a title When he was part of the Babylonian Empire and then later on the Medo-Persian Empire. And it was this, Chief of the Magi. Have you ever heard of that term before? As a matter of fact, you can connect all the dots. You can connect all the dots in the Bible. That actually, Daniel started a school of advisors, of wise men. And the descendants of those advisors became part of the Parthian Empire after the Greeks split up, and it was from there that that a certain number, we like to say three,
because of the gifts that they brought, came to visit Jesus. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. From the wise men that were from the east, part of the school of Daniel. But most importantly, and the thing I want to leave with you today at all of our locations is this. Leadership is measured by influence. And every story is a story about Jesus, right? Whether you're talking about the language they spoke, whether you're talking about the wise men that came to visit him when he was a baby. But more importantly, Jesus himself. At the beginning of Jesus' life, he had nothing. Isn't that true? He had questionable parentage. People questioned whether or not it was an illegitimate relationship between Mary and Joseph that actually produced Jesus. He was a man of poverty. He didn't have wealth or fame. He had no formal education to speak of, and he had no connections to higher-ups. In the end, when he died on the cross, he was completely alienated from the society that was around him. You could have put all of his followers, and did, actually, they put all of his followers in a single room, and he was considered at best a martyr and at worst a criminal. But you go back to Nebuchadnezzar's vision. He was the rock that was hewn out of the mountain, but not by human hands. He was the rock that began to roll down that hill. He was the rock that came in contact with the image that represents all the empires of man. The Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, and the Roman Empire. All those empires represented in that image that hadn't yet existed came in contact with this man, this one rock that was hewn out of a mountain that no man had hewn. In other words, he was born of God. And that rock goes down and it goes over the toes of that image and all the empires of the world come down and eventually that stone began to grow and it filled the whole earth. And you and I exist in that reality today where Jesus Christ and his message is filling the whole earth. He's the fourth man. Listen, he's the fourth man in the fiery furnace. He's the one that stands there with the other three who believe in courage over compromise. And he stands there in the fire. You know, he doesn't look down from heaven at you. He stands in the fire with you. Jesus came here before you. He died on a cross for you. He shared, shed real blood on that cross for you. He rose from the dead for you. He stands in the fire with us. He doesn't leave us. He doesn't forsake us. What did Jeremiah's letter say? I have plans for you, people. I've got plans for you. Not to harm you, but to prosper you. Plans that, that have something to do with hope and a future. You have an upper story. And you need to start thinking about that upper story. And not get lost down here in that lower story. Because you've got him. He's greater than any empire that ever stood, any army that ever marched, he's greater than all of that. Even Nebuchadnezzar, the ancient Babylonian king, saw it and knew it. Question is whether you know it. We're moving to a time of decision.